Hello, this is Matt on JEDU channel. After introduction to JNDI, let's go to its actual API in Java. In this video, I'll present you how to start your work with JNDI and its core interface, that is context. As you probably remember, context allows you to perform operations on a naming service. Those operations are for example lookup and binding, that are two of the most popular. In fact, context is the only place where you can perform them. You can't execute lookup operation without the context because this is a place where possible result of lookup operation is stored. The same is with binding. When you bind a name to an object, this is done within some context that will store this binding afterwards. Before presenting you in a few examples how context interface can be used, we'll briefly discuss its most important methods. Method number one is lookup. After previous video, you should have a good feeling what it does. It takes a name and retrieves the object associated with this name. At this point you may simply remember that the name is relative to a context on which method is invoked. The next is bind method with two parameters, name and an object. It simply creates a binding between those two past parameters. Unbind method removes this association and if the name is not bound to anything, uh, it does nothing. The third method is rebind that updates the association. If for example name1 was bound to object1, after revoking rebind operation with name1 in object2, name1 will be associated with object2. If name was bound to nothing, it will create the association like in bind operation. The difference is that bind operation will throw an exception if the name is already bound to some object. Then there are also two operations to create and destroy subcontext with given name in current context. Those are create subcontext and destroy subcontext. If you want to list all bindings that exist in a given context, you can use list bindings method that takes a name argument. This name is the name of the context which binding you want to retrieve. It is relative to the current context. Such binding contains name of an object, its class and the object. If you just want to retrieve a name of an object and its class, you can invoke list method that behaves as the previous one but does not retrieve an object in each binding. Besides, there are a couple of methods that we will not discuss in this video. They require a little bit more JNDI knowledge and we will get back to them after presenting key classes implementing name interface that represent JNDI name. It will be the topic of the next episode of this series about JNDI. Now let's run your favorite development environment since we will code some examples. As I said before, for each operation that we want to perform on a naming service, we need a context. We won't do anything without it. So we need to create some initial context to start our work. Usually, we do it by creating instance of initial context class that implements context interface. Let's do it. After creating such context, we may access a naming service with any service provider. But where does JNDI know what naming service should it work with? Of course we need to configure it. This configuration is passed to initial context as properties that are stored in hash table object. In JNDI, this set of properties we call an environment. If you want to know a little bit more about context environment, I invite you to the separate video that is exclusively about environment. In this example, we'll be accessing file system. It is also a naming service that maps file names to actual files on the disk. Unfortunately, it is not supported by JDK, so we need to download its service provider from external source. 
It can be downloaded as a jar file under the URL included in the description of this movie. After downloading it, you need to make sure that it is accessible from your project, so add it either to dependencies through your IDE or put it in your project class path. Um, in general, configuring environment for initial context depends on service provider we are using, but in our case, we will only specify two properties that are rather used exactly the same across different service providers. First, we need to specify that we want to use file system as our service provider. And we do it by putting in properties full name of a class that will create initial context. It must implement initial context factory interface and is provided by a service provider. And since it's part of file system service provider, it will create initial context for file system. All names that serve as key in our properties uh, are contained in context as static fields. For example, we configure initial context factory uh, for key that is specified by static field initial context factory. The second thing you need is to specify path on your local file system that this initial context will map to. I will use root directory of D drive. This path must be specified under provider URL key. If we used here DNS service, under this key we would pass the URL to the DNS server and in case of LDAP directory service we would pass the URL to the LDAP server followed by one of its partitions. Now, after creating these properties we simply need to pass it as a constructor parameter to the initial context. On the example of this context, we'll go through methods that I have presented in the start of this video. And although we are working with file system, it may seem that the only kind of object we work with are files. But it turns out that we can also save there and then retrieve any kind of Java object. The only requirement is that it must provide some method of saving its state. In JNDI there are two ways to handle it. First, we may add serializable interface to our class, but not all naming services and their service providers support serialization, for example file system. In this case, we need to go the second way, that is using JNDI references. You will see an example in a moment. In this video, we will work with an example class called monkey. It has three fields, two of them name and favorite fruit are strings and the third one is boolean value and specifies whether given monkey likes bananas. Let's create an instance of this class and try to store it in a naming service under name monkey Steven. This monkey will be named Steven and it will adore bananas. Since bind method may throw an exception we need to do something about it. In those simple examples we won't handle any exceptions, so let's redirect it to the JVM that will handle the exception thrown by main method and print it to the error output stream. Firing this example results in an exception. It is thrown by underlying service provider and says that we only may bind objects that are references or implement referenceable interface. This information relates to something I have mentioned before a minute. Monkey class must provide possibility to create its JNDI's reference. And we do it simply by implementing referenceable interface. It contains one method, getReference, that returns a reference to the object on which this method was invoked. Think about the reference as an object that stores address information about where is the object located. In JNDI, a reference object consists of list of addresses. Each address can be for example a network address, memory address or RMI address. All addresses should point to the same object. An example where more than one address may be used is a naming service that supports replication and each object is stored on a few nodes. 
since we will have influence on how reference object is created and then used to restore actual object by service provider we will hug it a little bit we will store in it three addresses and each of them will represent one field of our class so let's go to the example and code what I have just said I'm adding referenceable interface to our monkey class in its only method Get reference. I will create an instance of reference class for this monkey class that in the end will be returned from this method. Now we need to add to it three addresses. In JNDI, reference addresses may be represented by two classes string address and binary address. A string address is represented by its name and a string value, while the binary address also has a name but the value has a form of bytes array. I call the first field of two mentioned classes a name, but actually JNDI specifies it as address type. The first address, with its type set as a name, will have a value that is stored in this monkey's object name field. The similar applies to the second favorite fruit field. And just for pure convenience, we'll cast the first field of boolean type to the string and also save it as a string address. For this purpose, we'll use a static method to string of boolean class. Now, after those few changes, let's run our example. A binding was created successfully. But how can we check our results? The first answer that probably comes to your mind is that we can look at an object by name Monkey Steven, but for some reasons it won't work yet. There is one thing that needs to be done to make it work. At this point, we may check special.bindings file that was created in root directory of D drive. Let's open it. This file contains pieces of information that we stored in a reference. You can see that there are three reference addresses. Each of them has specified name and value that maps to addresses type and content fields. Also, there is an information that each of these addresses is a string address. Ok, now after binding an object, let us try to bind another object with the same name. We'll create another monkey Steven object that does not like bananas. As you probably remember from first part of this video, it won't work. Instead, we'll get name already bound exception. To make it work, we need to use rebind method. After executing following piece of code, Let's verify .bindings file. As you can see, the object has been updated. The last method that modifies a binding is unbind method, and its behavior is as its name suggests. It removes a binding. We'll invoke unbind method for name monkey Steven. Let's execute this example and verify .bindings file. Not only has the binding been removed from .bindings file, but also the whole .bindings file disappeared. This is how file system behaves if there is no binding in .bindings file. There is no point of keeping an empty file in a file system. Let's execute this example one more time. Nothing happened and no exception was thrown, so it means that performing unbind operation when there is no binding at all for a given name does nothing and does not fail. And that's the end of the first part of this video. In the second, you will see examples of the rest of the methods. Lookup, create subcontext, destroy subcontext and two methods for listing a context.
If you like the first part, you can click on a thumb up button below the video. Thanks for watching and see you in the second part.